Hey everyone, it's the R. Sean. Welcome to another edition of Great Sales Leaders, where we look at people who are doing amazing things in the sales world and give you lessons that you can transform to your sales organizations. Joining me today is my regular co-host, Shannon J. Gregg, and also Sean Rhodes. Sean Rhodes is a fellow speaker. He's also a consultant in the performance and productivity area, really gets some organizations moving forward. Uh, one of the reasons we brought Sean on the show is he just has an amazing sales system. I've got to learn about his sales systems through various channels. He knows what's going on. He's built the system, and he really gets the processes down. So he's been a fantastic guy. Shannon and I have put him on our resource list as one of our go-tos for people that just need to get a system down, get it working regularly, get it really process-oriented, because that's what he's fantastic at. So we'll have him join us in a minute. For those who don't tune in as often, I'm the Arshon. I'm a corporate lawyer by training. I work with people on everything, on the ownership and control of their business. So that might be a merger, a capital raise, a partnership agreement, or contract negotiation. And I also do this show, my future done right show, everything looking for how do we build business plans that really work as part of my speaking and strategy business. Shannon, who you'll see in just a minute, is a sales systems CRM expert. She works a lot with Salesforce, but she's also familiar with a variety of other systems. And what she's great at is getting systems and processes around sales and productivity. So we promise you today, after today's show, you'll have a better idea about what you can do for sales systems implementation, how it can work with your organization and move you forward. Love your comments. So drop them below wherever you're watching it, whether it's the R. Sean on LinkedIn, Sean Rhodes on LinkedIn, Shannon J. Greg on LinkedIn, R. Sean McBride hands on his Facebook, or the Great Sales Leaders YouTube channel. Wherever you're at, drop your comments. We do read them. We occasionally invite guests on there. We remind you we don't do legal advice or investment advice or anything like that on the show. Everything here is just for your education. With that, welcome to the show, Sean. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thank Appreciate you. being here. You've really built a great process. You know, we've talked several times. I've looked at what you've done. You are a process-oriented guy, and you use strong processes to drive your sales systems. Can you talk a little bit about what you've been doing and why it works? Absolutely. So the, the background I came from was in the military. I was one of those weird guys that was sent around the world to actually study what those military teams were doing that allowed them to be so successful. And I realized that I wasn't when I was traveling with them, I wasn't seeing the smartest people on the planet. Like these were not astrophysicists, but they had a different kind of intelligence. They relied on processes and systems to keep them safe, to keep them alive and to help them be more effective. So that when they went into a dangerous situation, it wasn't let's you know go into this sales call and see what happens. No, it's we, we know that this is our objective. Here are the things that might stand in our way. So let's prepare for those things before we face them, before we really get in a dangerous spot where we might lose the sale or in their case, lose their lives. Right. And as a result of that, they had a success rate that was absolutely phenomenal between 98 and 100% success rate for everything that they undertook. And these are dangerous missions where 50% of them statistically were not expected to walk back out of the building, but they had to do it every time. So it was life or death for them. When I opened my own business, I realized that I was working pure commission, no base for me. I had bills that were coming in, expenses, running a home office, you know, having to travel to go get gigs, having to market, having to sell, and I knew nothing about any of it. And so what I discovered was if I didn't have a system in place, I was basically just throwing a dart into the wind and hoping it landed somewhere near the target, which I find a lot of people in the sales world, that's how they begin. What I see experienced salespeople end up doing is they've tried things and failed so many times that they've ended up building a system that works for themselves, uh, yep. but they have a hard time actually explaining what that system is. They'd say, oh, we're, we, you know, I'm just natural at this, or people will look at them and their success and say, oh, he was, or she was born into this, you know, she really natural salesperson. I find that's never actually the case. If I look hard enough, I can usually see a system behind what they're doing. So when I began looking at what does that look like for somebody that has to make cold calls because that's how i get the majority of my business cold outreach i had to one qualify my prospects in a very certain way which we can talk about what that might look like for a sales manager and their team yeah. i had to actually build a series of steps to run them through which i didn't even know existed before but i realized if i do the same maybe 12 things over a two-week period 
I'm starting to get results. And then what do I do with the people that I wasn't able to close on that initial outreach that I wasn't able to get that conversation with? I realized I had a whole bunch of attrition, which in most sales worlds or for a sales manager looks like all of those qualified prospects that are floating out there that we're not in contact with right now, but they could be buyers. What do we do with all those people? So when I began looking at what do I actually build in systems and processes to capture all of these things, I realized that I didn't have to think so hard. I could rely on my systems to tell me and my sales team, which I eventually began to build, what it is that they need to do on any given day across hundreds and hundreds of prospects to keep in touch with all of them in the right time, to make sure I'm in the right place when they're ready to make a buying decision. All of those things really allowed me to leverage systems and processes to be successful in sales. Yeah. It's, it's so powerful, Sean, the way that you describe it and the way that your realization came. And I think so many salespeople, because they do think it's innate, I was born with it, I'm good at it. You know, it's the art of the, the sales. You know, that's what I am. I'm an artist. How did you encourage your team to think more about the science of sales and less about the art of sales? It started with getting clear about what it was we were selling. And I make the majority of my revenue through keynote talks. I go to conventions, I go to association meetings, I'm talking to executives, helping them better manage change and create better pivot points in their business. That's the topic I speak on. But I realized when I was calling up to these folks who I knew were going to buy a speaker, it might be me, it might be Sean McBride, it might be somebody else, they were gonna buy a speaker. If I called up and said, I'm a keynote speaker, and then tried to sell them on that premise, they weren't really buying it because I turned myself into a commodity. So what I really had to begin looking at is I'm not selling keynote speeches. I'm not selling consulting. I'm selling solutions. And because I reach into a wide array of industries, just like every one of the people listening right now, whether you're a sales manager or whether you're one of those people wearing the soles of your shoes out on the street, developing those leads, every person you run into is going to have a unique story and a unique set of challenges for their business, for their organization. And you may be only selling into widget manufacturers in lower Southeast Nebraska, who all tend to have the same challenges, but those widget manufacturers are going to have different goals, you know, for their business, for themselves, for their families. So what I had to begin doing and training my salespeople to do was to not go in there guns blazing, trying to talk about how great our value proposition was. It was to say, this may be a really short call. We just qualify ourselves early. Uh, I'd love to know a little bit about what you're trying to achieve at XYZ event or with XYZ initiative that you have underway that I read about in the news. And if I can help, great. If not, I'll find somebody who can and send them your way as well. Just want to be a resource. And then I shut up and I taught my salespeople to shut up and listen to what they said next. Because so great. <laughs> everything that they told us after that was a piece of ammunition that I just capture in my notebook or in my head. And I'd say, how does that match up to the solutions I can provide? And if I can't provide them, if they're looking for legal advice on how to really transition partnerships well in a business, well, that's not me. I'm not qualified, but I got a guy, Arshon McBride. He's the dude. So it began really opening up a new world for me when I realized I didn't have to sell keynotes or consulting or workshops or widgets or whatever it is that I was selling that day. It was really more about finding what their needs were. And then if I can match my value proposition and my solutions up to those needs, it really became easy to make the sale after that. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. And, I, you know, and you've really got a philosophy behind your system. I think that's what's important, right? You didn't just design a system. You started with a philosophy. We're going to listen. We're going to learn. We're going to collect information. And I imagine that's reflected in that process you've now designed or that you're using. Sure is. Sure is. And the, the beauty about having processes, I've built processes for every step of my selling process from cold outreach all the way to close. And then I realized if I can systemize that portion of my business, which is in a lot of people's minds, the hardest part of you know, business, getting, getting the prospect converted, educating them, making sure that the check hits the bank and actually cashes into the account, all those things that we worry about generating revenue with, why couldn't I systemize everything after the point of sale as well? See, what I realized, Sean, was, and you and I are part of this industry in the National Speakers Association, where we have conferences, just like all of our listeners do, I'm sure, where they go to a place and they get the newest best practices for what works in our industry to convert a sale, to deliver the highest value. But a lot of problems run in when you get back to the office and you've got emails and voicemails and meetings to go to, and this whole notebook, absolutely full of stuff. I got one right here full of great ideas. Mm -hmm. But how many of them actually get implemented? Or if I implement them, I might only do it for a short period of time and then it just floats off and I stop using them. And I wonder why I can't predict success in my business. Well, it's because I haven't created any kind of a predictable system to judge it by. So right. what I realized was, especially in selling, 
although I've got a shelf full of books in front of me, I'm sure all your, your people listening do too, selling process, pitch anything, you mastering the complex sale, these, these great like seminal works in, 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 in literature and selling. If I learn something from one of those, I want to be able to plug it into a pre-existing system so that I know it gets used every single time on every single call with every single proposal. And yeah. then I know, you know, is this actually dedicated to my success? Is it, is it leveraging what I've learned in order to make me a more successful salesperson? And if I'm only using it occasionally, that's not predictable. But right. even if I build a very simple outreach, you know, email, phone call, email, LinkedIn, whatever that looks like, and I can find something new at one of our professional meetings or from reading a book or an article in the Wall Street Journal. And I say, wow, that would be really fun to try. Well, that's brilliant. How come I haven't thought about that before? I can plug yeah. it in and my system will tell me whether you're using Salesforce or any kind of other CRM or even a project management system. It'll tell me this is the next step in the process that you've told us you need to do. Make sure you do it. Okay, yeah. great. And I go do that and I check that box, but I know I've delivered consistent value across all of my prospects and then upon sales delivery, upon what I'm actually providing them as a service. Right. So let's step back earlier. You, you said something interesting, which is, you know, you have a process down, you don't have to think. And so, but then you're also thinking about the system, right? So I'd love for you to talk a little bit about, you know, what the process does to conserve kind of that mental energy. It sounds like you've got something where, you're using your thinking to think about the process and the system periodically, but you're not using as much of your mental energy on every individual sales call. Right. So the, the, the analogy I've heard, and I'm sure you all know the research that, that backs this up, it's very difficult for a human to think strategically and tactically and bounce back and forth between the two. Mm -hmm. We're either really, really good at fine details, or we can step back and we can have a brainstorming session and really think like outside the box, blue ocean type stuff. But to have to go back and forth almost scrambles the brain. It's, it's just using different elements of our brain in a weird way. Uh, at least that's the way it is for me. I find that what systems allow me to do is I can walk into a sales call knowing just a real quick review because my system tells me, here's this person, here's their name, here's when the next uh, selling cycle is going to begin for them, here's what that, that pricing model might look like for you know, how much they're qualified to buy for, and here's what I think might be a good fit for them. I review all that before I walk into the sales call because my systems are there to, to help me with that. And then when I'm in the sales call, I can think on my feet. I can pivot in the moment. I can take the direction of the conversation in a completely weird angle if I feel like that's the best thing to do because I'm not having to think about what's the next step in my process. Oh, gosh, I, I, I know I learned this. I know I did it really, really good three months ago, but I've, I've been in a slump since then. But what did I do on that one sales call three months ago that really, really worked well? I don't have to you know, try to scramble my brain thinking about all that. I can take a look at my checklist that I walk in with. Here's all the information that I've decided I need to know to really do a good job at this. Here's the information I'm still missing that I need to make sure I get. And then I can be present with the client or with the prospect because I don't have to think about 20 different things floating in the air that I need to make sure I grab. I've gotten 18 of them before I step in the room or gotten on the phone. I bet right. too, Sean, some of it, it, it goes back to trying to erase that fight or flight syndrome, especially in sales when we're so conditioned to be ready for objections. And I think if you allow your amygdala to act in that way and you don't have a system that says, hey, muscle memory, here's exactly what I'm going to use to overcome that objection. Because there's probably only 10, right? You probably only come across 10. So um, tell me a little bit about how your past experience has converted into your current day practice in terms of using that muscle memory to sort of overcome objective, objections and save the sale. Absolutely. So a lot of this comes down to continuous improvement, which systems allow you to be able to do. Um, otherwise, the only thing that you can do is just make enough mistakes that you get good. Yep. And for, for me, uh, you know, losing a sale could mean losing $15,000 uh, of, of, of top line revenue. And I like money. So I don't want to lose that sale if I can help it. So what happens is I'm tracking on every sales call, whether it's a, an initial call to find out who the decision maker might be or whether I, it's one of those official like I'm in the room with the decision maker. I know they're ready to make a decision. I just have to convince them I'm the guy they make the decision with. Whether, no matter where I am in the process, I'm paying attention to things that I don't have answers to or I don't have a good enough answer to, mm -hmm. an objection that I might not have had to struggle with before or a question that was valid but I didn't have an answer to that I could really you know, kick off in a real concise way. And so I'm tracking all of those things and at the end of a week or the end of a month, I can sit down either by myself if I'm a sole operator and I was doing this for a while or I sit down with my team and I actually – demand that my team brings me problems that they've encountered on, on the course of their sales calls during the week. 
So yeah. and they're not allowed to get in that meeting without five, at least five. And if they came up with solutions because they solved them or they'd read about it in a book and it was brilliant, great, but bring me five. And what we do each week is we hack out what the solutions might look like and then we build those into our processes. And yep. so we're, we're iterating every week to get a little bit better, maybe two, 3% better every single week, but do that over the course of a year and a half and the solutions start to compound. And now as, as the leader, let's say you're a sales manager listening right now, I only want to deal with brand new challenges because that really fires me up as a leader, right? But if I'm dealing with the same objection and I have five salespeople, let's say, and they're all coming to me and saying, all the prospects say that what, we, what we're trying to charge is too much. I can only solve that problem so many times for my salespeople before it begins to drive me up a wall. What I want to do is say, you know, we've dealt with that before. Go to our lessons, learn plan, you know, run a search function on that objection. There's a lot of great responses we've come up with over the last couple of years. Use those and let me know if they don't work. Then we'll come up with a new one. But otherwise, it's only new stuff that gets brought to me these days because everything else has already been solved and built into a process and a system and a database that people can look up and find answers to. So it yeah. really allows me to work on fine tuning my business, the work on the business so much instead of in the business, which I know a lot of our leaders challenge with too. Yeah, I, you, I think you may, you may have stumbled through this answer and answered something that we get a lot. Shannon and I get this question from many of the sales managers we encounter, which is, what do I do when my team keeps interrupting me with problems, right? So many of the sales managers, you know, and this comes up often in connection with our time management work. You know, it's one of the jobs of a sales manager is problems pop up. You, you encourage people to bring you your problems as part of the meetings. A lot of sales managers have problems just popping up every day. You know, I'm, 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 in, a, I'm in a sales process with XYZ company and I got this objection I wasn't expecting. You know, XYZ is a big account. Can you help me? What do I do with this objection? What's your process, Sean, or what do, you, what, do you, what do you tell people as far as dealing with these daily little fires that crop up? Yep, um, I tell them that if you don't permanently solve the problem, it is going to come back to haunt you later. Yep. And when I say permanently solve the problem, I mean solve that problem in perpetuity for the rest of your organization's existence. And so if a salesperson comes to you and says, listen, boss, I'm, I'm dealing with this $35 million company. They're a small manufacturer. We're trying to sell them X. We've run into this problem in the sales process. What do you recommend I do? Well, that's great. That's what you're there for as a sales manager, hopefully with enough experience and insight to be able to guide that salesperson to the correct solution. But what a lot of sales managers miss is an opportunity to capture that solution. So that the next time a salesperson has a problem like that with a similarly sized company and they get lagged in the sales process by that same issue, they shouldn't have to bring it to you again because you've already solved the problem. So why not capture that somewhere that you can then begin directing people towards? Now, one way to get this started like today is to just open up a Google spreadsheet and you know, blanket out a couple of columns. You want to know what the issue was. You want to know what the uh, proposed solution was from the salesperson. And if they don't have one, that's okay. But encourage them to start bringing you not just problems, but also maybe, you know, I, I could try X, Y, or Z, but what do you think is the best uh, solution for this boss? Mm -hmm. That's fine. That's second column. Third column is who's responsible or who was involved in the situation. Fourth column, most important one, is how do we know the solution has been implemented? Yep. Or what is the result of that? You know, you brought me this problem. I recommended you do X. Check in with me in a week and let's capture it somewhere. X worked. So yep. X needs to be part of our permanent process in this sales you know, organization so that if you run into that problem again, you do that first. Try that. And if it doesn't work, then bring it to me and we'll figure something else out. But if you begin capturing solutions in that way, then you can start directing your salespeople there. And you start to build up this massive database that, by the way, is a wonderful transition plan. So when you get promoted to VP of business development up at the corporate office, you don't take everything that you've learned with you. It can stay with your organization. It becomes an incredibly valuable resource if you are just a peer amongst a lot of sales managers. Maybe there's 20 sales managers in your organization. Why not begin building this thing collectively so that the entire organization gets the benefit? That, yeah. that is so powerful, Sean. I think yeah. one of the biggest things we struggle with in sales management is that tribal knowledge. And what happens to that tribal knowledge when somebody does get promoted or the statistics say most people are staying in sales leadership positions for 18 months and then they're transitioning out. And I think your idea, which is build a system, even if it's simple, start today. 
start right now and start capturing that sort of information so that other people can learn from it. Because while customers may change the way they're buying, their psyches aren't changing, right? right. They're staying the same. They have the same objections. They have the same problems. And they're going to continue to reinvent themselves, you know, every, every once in a while. So I love that idea of capturing it, even a very simple system. What other places have you found that it's really helpful to capture that tribal knowledge and, and really put it in a place where everybody can access it in a centralized way? Yeah, so it's great to not only do this with your salespeople, but it's great to do it with your customers as well. And the way that I do that is after I get done delivering X service, and let's say maybe that if you're selling a product, maybe you check in you know, six months or a year after you've installed the product. If it's a service, check in after completion of service. And, and I, I want to walk my client through what we've built together to make sure that I've delivered exactly what their expectation was. And if I haven't, how far was I off target? What can I do to adjust fire next time for the next client? Or if, if it's really gone off, off the rails, you know, how do I make it better so that I get to maintain you as a client or at least not you, you know, have you out there talking about how crappy it was to work with Sean Rhodes, right? So what I recommend doing with people is to hop on the phone and you're, you're running through. When we started this project, you said you wanted our service or product so that you could achieve X. Did we help you do that? Has, has X been achieved? And if not, what can we do to get it back? And we also want to know, you know, what kind of feedback you would give us. So even if we did a great job for you, what would be an even better if? Like if you were going to re-engage with my company, what would really take service to the next level for you? Would it be a phone call, a Christmas card, a back massage? I mean, you tell me, you know, blue, blue ocean here. What is it that we could do to really put us at the top of, of your list of vendors or suppliers for this product or service? Yeah. And you're capturing all of that information, you know, just on the phone or in person, doesn't matter. And it's also a great point to, to get some referral generation going on. Well, if, you know, if we did such a great job for you, who do you have in your network? Because they're think they're pumped up. Yeah, you did wonderful for us. Couldn't recommend you hire. Great. Who else do you know in your network that would also benefit from this product or service? And what I do with that information as a salesperson is I would feed that up to my sales manager, who would then in turn feed it up to the VP of business development, who could share it with the executive board, because you're getting frontline information on how your product or service could be improved. If you're a shop of one, that's great. It's a conversation right here at your desk. Maybe you're part of a larger sales organization. This is a great way to say, listen, our valued clients out there in the field say that we're doing a good job, but it would be even better if we could do X. Let's begin building X so that we can stay ahead of the rate of change in our industry to give them what they need before it becomes a market demand that we don't have the infrastructure to deliver. Yep. Isn't he the master, Shannon? Yes. <laughs> I told you you were going to love it. Uh, and I'm sure, I'm sure our listeners are loving it too because it's just fantastic information. Sean, why don't you tell folks a little bit about what you're doing broader than this? I mean, this is just a component of what you do. Why don't you tell folks what you're doing, how they can get a hold of you and See if there's a fit out there at some point. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, my website is uh, shoshinconsulting.com, which I'm sure is going to be in the links. Uh, you can find me. I've got a TEDx talk. Uh, what I'm doing these days is helping organizations implement change, whether that looks like a change that's being imposed on them because of a market shift or a customer shift, or whether it's an initiative they have. We'd love to achieve X. We just had struggles doing it. I'm the guy that comes in there, helps apply systems, build systems, hold people accountable, and continuously improve their operations every day. Um, something that if you haven't done as a salesperson yet, I recommend you, you look into, there's this concept called watertight marketing that's been brilliant for me. And I, I would be, uh, I'd feel bad if I didn't bring it up to your listeners. I mentioned I had one outbound campaign and we had a lot of attrition, okay? And this is pretty common for salespeople. What I began doing is building campaigns to the left and the right of that outbound campaign that they could flow into. So they weren't just floating around in the ether. So we keep in touch with you in three weeks, four weeks, six months, whatever that looks like. And let's say that we do convert you. We find out who the decision maker is. We line up when you're going to be buying. I still want to stay in touch with you until that buying decision happens. So build campaigns to that area as well. The thing that really made the difference for us, and you can do this inside Salesforce or most CRMs, close the loops on each of those campaigns so that one flows into the other. So if you can imagine a pipeline that has no outlet, you can just feed new leads in, but no one ever stops in circulation. That has really allowed us to, you know, uh, blow out of the water what our revenue expectations were this year because no one ever loses touch with the value that we provide. Right. That's awesome. It's a great yeah. tip. So check it out. Sean does an amazing job. He is the systems guy. So we, we thank the world of him. So glad you could join us today, Sean. 
uh, folks, you know, we love your comments. So drop them below if you have questions or whatever. I know I'll be checking the comments afterwards. I imagine Sean will probably pop in as well. So we'll be reading those comments, checking out what you're saying, seeing. I uh, also want to remind you, there's a library of episodes over at uh, Sales Leadership Done Right. That's our website where we have our past episodes. We have our upcoming guests listed. You can also get on our email list if you want additional tips, tricks, and some notes of some of the shows. Check us out over there. So, everybody, thanks for joining us today, Sean. It was a lot of fun. And I want to thank the audience and say, you know, pat yourself on the back for doing the hard work, for getting yourself prepared for the future, uh, for preparing to be a leader. And just reach out to us if we can do anything for you guys. Thanks, everyone. Have a good day.